Good evening. I would like to welcome you to the Jewish Theological Seminary. It is wonderful to have you with us tonight. My name is Utsdaya and I am the Research and Program Manager of the Center for Pastoral Education. Some of you may be here for the first time and we are particularly happy to welcome you. And we hope that you will join us in the future for future programs. Tonight's program, which is the JTS Jack and Louis Wooden Lecture, is co-sponsored by the Center for Pastoral Education at JTS and the Louis Finkelstein Institute for Religious and Social Studies at JTS. The Rudin Lecture series at JTS provides the opportunity for eminent academics, religious leaders, intellectuals, and public figures to discuss topics of interest with the JTS community and the public at large. Although Jack and Susan Rudin unfortunately could not be with us this evening, we would like to take this opportunity to extend our thanks to them for sponsoring the Rudin Lecture Series, which is named for Mr. Rudin and his late brother Lewis. We are very happy to be able to welcome a representative of the Rudin Foundation with us tonight, Vice President and Program Director, Mr. Mark Gordon. I would like to introduce to your distinguished panelists. Justice Baird, who received his ordination from Hebrew Union College, is the director of the Center for Multi-Faith Education at Auburn Theological Seminary since 2007. And he oversees the seminary's multi-faith program, which strives to prepare religious leaders for a religiously diverse world. Saul Berlin is the associate professor of Jewish studies at Stern College for Women at Yeshua University and the adjunct professor of law at Columbia Law School. He was an inaugural fellow of the Tikva Center for Law and Jewish Civilization at NYU School of Law and served as a director of Edal for many, many years. Ordained at Yeshiva University, he has served as a rabbi for many years, latest at Lincoln Square Synagogue, which is familiar to many here in the audience, in Manhattan. Suzanne Last Stone is a university professor of Jewish law and contemporary civilization at Yeshiva University, professor of law and director of the Center for Jewish Law and Contemporary Civilization at Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law. Professor Stone publishes and writes widely on the intersection of Jewish thought, legal theory, and the humanities. She has held the Gross Visiting Chair in Talmudic Civil Law at both Harvard Law School and the University of Pennsylvania Law School. And last but not least, Professor Bert Wiesowski is the Admiral Professor of Midrash and Interreligious Studies at JTS. He is also the Louis Stein Director of the Louis Finkelstein Institute for Religious and Social Studies and the Director of the Milstein Center for Interreligious Dialogue at JTS. He holds degrees from Harvard and JTS as well as rabbinic ordination from JTS. Professor Wiesowski served as the Master Visiting Professor of Jewish Studies at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, and he is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and sits on the board of Fordham Law Stein Center of Law and Ethics. And I will now turn over the word to Justice Bird, who will serve as the moderator to introduce the topic of this evening. Well, Thank you, Guru. Um, good evening and welcome to everyone. My name is Justice Baird and I uh, work across the street uh, diagonally at the Auburn Theological Seminary where we are doing our part to build a multi-faith movement for justice. Uh, I'm really excited to be here uh, to moderate this panel tonight um, with our th three distinguished scholars. Um, before this moment, for uh, all day actually, about 20 scholars from many different fields gathered to look at um, what, could, what does Jewish tradition teach us about the other from the fields of rabbinics, uh, from the fields of literature, from uh, the fields of ethics, philosophy, literary criticism. Um, to be honest, I'm extremely stimulated already and I, I hope that um, you will be stimulated tonight as well. My job as moderator uh, first is to keep things moving. If you've ever been in a class, I, I went to UCC, although I'm married to JTS, I'm married to a, a graduate of JTS, and I've heard that sometimes scholars, you know, talk, so I'm going to do my best to keep them on time. Um, second, uh, my job is to make sure that we keep it relevant. Tonight will not only be about Torah Lishma, tonight will also be about reaching into our tradition to make sure that we are dealing with contemporary issues that really matter most. And on that note, um, one of the things I learned earlier today is that there are a little over, according to many estimates, 11 million undocumented immigrants who at any given time are in this country, which I thought was interesting because it's actually not that far from the number of Jews 
that there are in the world, right? 12 or 13 million Jews in the world, and 11 million undocumented immigrants in this country. That got me thinking. Um, here's three questions to keep in mind as we learn from these scholars. First, when and where do you feel like the other? When do you feel included and when do you feel excluded? <clears throat> Second, what are our responsibilities to the other? And whatever, however you may define the other tonight, which we'll be talking quite a bit about. <clears throat> and third, what can Jewish tradition teach us? How can Jewish tradition guide us as we answer those questions? So with that, uh, we will begin with Dr. Uh, Burton, Rabbi Dr. Burton Vysotsky. Um, we'll continue with Dr. Suzanne, uh, Dr. Suzanne Stone and conclude with Rabbi Selburn. Break your up. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Justice. And uh, it's a pleasure to see all of you. I'm honored to be, uh, once again, part of a Rudin lecture. I appreciate the support of uh, the Rudins for JTS programming. And uh, I am first on the agenda tonight, uh, partly because I am the director of the Louis Finkelstein Institute and a co-sponsor, so um, I paid for my right to speak first. <laughs> um, I confess I'm, I'm a little daunted to be in the presence of two such august legal, legalists and halachists, um, which uh, I suppose answers the first question that you asked, Justice. Um, right now, I feel like the other, uh, because I, I tend not to, uh, I, I am a rabbi and occasionally do teach law, but um, my area of expertise is really uh, rabbinic narrative, and, and I am uh, agada, uh, how the rabbis uh, do everything but law, if you will. And I, I want to talk about that, but I want to talk about that um, textually. Uh, I think every one of you has... Uh, a two-page handout, that is to say, two-page double-sided handout. Um, and uh, it's very thoughtfully figured out how to put in numbers for each of the sources and still keep it to the four pages, which was very impressive. Um, of course, the cost of doing that is I can't read it any longer. It's too small. <laughs> but, um, but I brought a large print version. Um, I, I, I want to start with, with three very, very quickly, with three verses from the Torah, one from Exodus, one from Leviticus, and one from Deuteronomy, because um, my Bible colleagues tell me these are disparate sources of Scripture. Nevertheless, the motif remains the same. Um, in Exodus, we are taught not to pressure the stranger. Um, the word there, I, these are my translations, so they're somewhat uh, quirky. Um, don't oppress the stranger, perhaps. Lachatz, to put pressure on, uh, is a word that we see in the Passover Haggadah. Um, why? Uh, so it, it's especially apposite that we're talking about Egypt. This is partly what Egypt did to us. And yet, we are commanded not to pressure the stranger. You should know the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Um, that's Exodus. Leviticus? When a stranger dwells among you, do not oppress. Uh, the verb for oppress, tonu, um, again, a verb that's used for how the Egyptians treated us as slaves in Egypt. It's also the verb of how Sarah abused her Egyptian handmaid. Uh, the stranger who dwells among you should be treated like the citizen. And this is, I, I think, an essential verse of scripture Love the stranger as yourself. You were strangers in the land of Egypt. And then that tagline, I am the Lord your God. Uh, often we see in scripture that that three line, three words in Hebrew, on Adonai Elohechem, I am the Lord your God, is added, and the Midrash commentary, and why it's added, since it's superfluous to a command, is that um, God sometimes has to remind you on ethical and moral matters you might be inclined to slide or play fast and loose. After all, it's not ritual. It's something that you might be able to get away with. It's subtle. I am the Lord your God. I'm going to know whether you're treating the stranger properly. I'm going to know what's in your heart. I, Lord, the Lord our God. And therefore, um, this odd command to love the stranger, 
We're also taught, uh, you should love your neighbor as yourself. The rabbis universally interpret, not universally, um, in vast majority though, interpret your, your neighbor to be your Jewish neighbor. But here in Leviticus, we're explicitly enjoined also to love the stranger, the non-Jew among us. And then the Deuteronomic um, verse starts with, do justice for the widow and the orphan, and then again, love the stranger, give him bread and raiment. You shall love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. This continual reminder that we were strangers in the land of Egypt, however we may count that biblical history, whether it's 200, 400 years, um, we all have, I guess, North African blood in us. Um, and it is essential that that part of our history be something that informs our identity. Um, of late, in the last 15 years, I've been asked regularly, usually around Passover time, um, and uh, I'm looking at Professor Adrian Levine, a Bible professor, um, who actually knows something about scripture, so um, afterwards you can ask her whether it's true or not. But um, I'm, I'm asked, is it true um, that we were in Egypt? Were we really slaves in Egypt? Is there historical evidence for the Exodus, etc., etc.? Um, is it true? I was once on a panel at the 92nd Street Y with my friend Tom Cahill, and someone from the audience asked how much of the Bible is true. And Tom, who uh, can be somewhat tongue-in-cheek, said, how much of the Bible is true? 57.4%. <laughs> the person who asked the question dutifully took a notebook out of her pocket and wrote down 57.4%, which was somewhat dismaying. Um, Tom looked to me for rescue. And uh, I said this, and I'll stand by it, which is that um, how much is true is a very difficult question. What she, I think, really meant to ask is what is verifiable historically? Because the fact is that we learn much great truth in our life from reading fiction. So what's true is probably 100% of the Bible on a good day, uh, whether it's historically factual or not, is almost incidental. But it, it comes back to that question, were we in fact slaves in the land of Egypt? Were we strangers, as the Bible says again and again? And my response is, if we weren't, if it's not historically accurate, what an amazing people we are to invent such a history. Right? Rather than say we are the offspring of giants and kings, I suppose we do say we're the offspring of kings, but um, to say again and again and again that we were strangers really speaks to the existential identity of the Jewish people, whether now or throughout history. Um, the fourth source, from Deuteronomy is somewhat different than the first three because it actually fetches a little bit about certain strangers. Ammonites and Moabites, we don't like them so much. Um, even to the tenth generation, they shall not ever join the community of the Lord. This looks like a pretty ferocious biblical commandment that there's no getting around, which is why I brought Source 5 as well. But what interests me is not so much that we're fetching about Ammon and Moab, as the next couple of lines where I've broken the paragraph, but do not abhor the Edomite, for he is your brother. Edom, Asaph, yes, our brother, but our enemy. Asaph, in rabbinic mind, Rome, the quintessential oppressor. And yet the Torah commands us, do not abhor him, nor shall you abhor the Egyptian once more for you were a stranger in his land. Now we're going to leave the Bible behind because um, it's not my expertise and I'm worried that uh, Professor Levine will get the union on me. Oh, Ace, you know I'm just going to use you as a straw person here. Um, so, um, but, uh, but now we turn to rabbinics. Um, I, I'm jumping, le literally leaping almost a millennium to the second, early third century of the Common Era. 
um, practically yesterday. And uh, in the early third century, there is a response, in a way, to this Deuteronomic source we just read. Because an Ammonite, who's not supposed to come in, right? An Ammonite came and stood before the rabbis in the Beit Midrash and asked, well, can I come? Can I join the community? I'm guessing that he wanted to convert, although he's defined, he's described as Yehuda Ger Ammoni, that he's an Ammonite Ger. Now, in rabbinic Hebrew, Ger normally means a convert. Um, so here they're playing with the ambivalence of the word, that in Biblical Hebrew it's a stranger, in Rabbinic Hebrew it's a stranger who wants to join the community. He asks his question. Now, we've all read the scriptural passage, even unto the tenth generation. They shall not ever join the community. So Rabban Gamaliel responds by saying, you are forbidden to enter. That seems fairly straightforward, <coughs> until Rabbi Yehoshua does what rabbis do so well. He says, you are permitted. Now, this is rather exceptional, and Gamaliel has to say, uh, excuse me, there's a verse of scripture, right? And he quotes Deuteronomy, our source for, and the Ammonite, or Moabite, shall not enter the community of the Lord, even unto the tenth generation. And now it's Rabbi Yehoshua's turn. Rabbi Yehoshua says, and he asks a good question, he's now living in the Roman world, he says, are Ammon and Moab in their places? In other words, biblical times are long gone. We don't know who an Ammonite or a Moabite may be. They're not on their property. Didn't Sancheirev, king of Assyria, come and mix together all the nations? And now he loves a verse of scripture right back. Isaiah, chapter 10. I have removed the borders of the peoples. I've plundered their treasures. I've exiled their dwellers. In other words, everybody's all mished off. We don't know an Ammonite from a Moabite. Therefore, anyone who comes, as it were, hat in hand with good intention, is qualified to be part of the people. Gamaliel says, uh 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 uh, -uh not so fast. Because Jeremiah says, after that, I shall restore the exile of the Ammonites. Indeed, they have returned. Rabbi Hoshua not easily bullied, responds by saying, well, very nice, but scripture also says, I will restore the exile of my people, Israel and Judah. And of course, he's quite right, in his day, they had not been restored. There's a certain irony here that Rabbi Yahushua and Rabbi Gamaliel are arguing in the land of Israel, um, but as far as Yahushua is concerned, the exile indeed has not been restored. There is no Jewish king in his day. They are under Roman rule. And therefore, if Amos's hope for restoration is not true, nor is Jeremiah's, if Jeremiah's is not true, Sancheirev's mixing up the people stands, and therefore, they permitted him to enter the community. So this is in the face of what seems to be a biblical prohibition, a willingness to entertain the possibility of the other becoming part of the people of Israel. I want to jump ahead, because the rabbis, having read all of these verses, say in Source 6, if you coerce a stranger, you've transgressed three negative commandments. And if you oppress a stranger, those are, those are the two separate verbs we saw earlier, then you've transgressed two. And now, I love the counting here. Why did the Torah warn 36 places? and some say 48 places regarding the stranger. In other words, the rabbis who are not actually very good at math, and I, I, I'm very hard pressed to see how they came up with 36, let alone 48. Um, I think this is a, a, an inflation of the numbers for a rhetorical point. Their point is, the Torah says again and again and again, dozens of times, don't oppress the stranger. Why? because otherwise you're tempted to do evil. It's so easy to see someone as the other and oppress them. That's why the Torah continually warns you and reminds you, hello, you were there, have some memory. You were once the stranger, now look at someone else and see yourself. Why does it say don't coerce or oppress? You don't bring up in your colleague the blemish you too have. We were once strangers, be sympathetic. How sympathetic? I'm going to turn ever so briefly to what might or might not be Jewish law. 
Um, again, I'm going to leave it to, to, to um, Suzanne and to Sol to, to actually plumb whether this Tosefta is or is not a Jewish law or you'll ignore it as you see fit. But um, there are, there's a Tosefta and then a, a piece of Talmud. The Tosefta from around the third century, a companion piece to the Mishnah, says as follows. <coughs> When a community has both Jews and non-Jews, which is to say almost every community, Jewish charity officers collect from both. It's interesting. In other words, we collect tzedakah from Gentiles. Why? To assure communal harmony. Because, as we all know, if Gentiles don't get to give to Jewish causes, they may be offended. Right? They want parity. In fact, we have archaeological evidence from antiquity that Gentiles fairly, I, I can say um, epigraphically we know this, literally it's written in stone that Gentiles gave to Jewish institutions. There's a long inscription from Aphrodisius in Asia Minor listing name after name after name of Gentiles who clearly were donors to the synagogue. And they're listed there under the title of Sibomenoi, the pious one. Um, the converse is certainly true, that charity officers, therefore Jewish charity officers, disperse charity, not just to Jews, but also to Gentiles, to assure communal harmony. Not that it's a mitzvah for the Torah, but that you live with Gentiles, you want communal harmony, so you do the right thing. This is a justification that was used in the early part of the 20th century, when they started building Jewish hospitals, and the question was, well, what if non-Jews want to use those hospitals? Answer, we invite non-Jews to use those hospitals for communal harmony. You mourn for and properly bury the dead of Gentiles to assure communal harmony. You offer condolences to Gentiles to assure communal harmony. Now I'm going to leap a couple of hundred years to the Palestinian Talmud, and you'll see it replicates what we just read and then expands the surface. In a city of Jews and Gentiles, collectors collect from both Jews and Gentiles, source number eight, and disperse to both Jews, Gent Jewish poor and Gentile poor. Next, they visit the sick of Jews and Gentiles. Now we're into the chaplaincy program. We bury the dead of the Jew and the Gentile dead. You comfort Jewish mourners and Gentile mourners, and now, lovely, you dower both Gentile as well as Jewish brides. In other words, you make sure that their daughters can afford the wedding that they would like to have, that is to say, dowry. For both Jewish girls and Gentile girls, you make sure that they are able to continue having families in their community for communal harmony. One last Mishnah before we turn to one of my favorite narratives in all of rabbinic literature. This is a Mishnah from Tractates on Hedron, it's about how we set up our courts, how we adjure witnesses, things like that. And as a, almost an aside, it says, Adam was created alone. That is to say, earth person, that first human, to teach us harmony among God's creatures. Why? So no one can ever say, my ancestor was greater than yours. We all trace ourselves back to the same first human being. Therefore, we all share some lineage. My final source is an Agadah, and it's about what happens in the rabbinic community when you can, for instance, spend your days learning Torah and miss the point. This is known to happen. <coughs> The rabbis start by saying, You should be as pliable as the reed and not hard like the cedar. Once it happened that Rabbi Elazar, the son of Rabbi Shimon of Bigdol Gedor, was traveling from his teacher's home, riding his donkey on the river bank, and he was very pleased with himself. Arrogance about how much Torah he had learned. We can watch him pat himself on the back as he rides. On the way, he encountered a very ugly man. Now this phrase just really captures me. 
Adam Mechuar Beyoter. Because, of course, ugliness is always in the eye of the beholder. Ugliness is a way in which you perceive someone to be other. In fact, if you see someone who is other, you prefer to think them ugly. You want to demean them. And so you call them names, or you don't think of them as fully human, or they're not quite your zip code. So he sees this fellow, and the fellow greets him and says, Shalom. <coughs> Shalom Alecha Rabbi. Peace to you, my rabbi, my master. But El Azar answers arrogantly and says, Idiot. I, I want to get that in Hebrew so that you can test my translation. Literally, empty head or empty one. How ugly you are. And then he, the kicker says, are all your townsmen as ugly as you? I mean, this is real, low down, nasty. And that man answers brilliantly. He says, I don't know. But go and tell the artisan who created me how ugly is the vessel you created. It's really a wonderful rebuke to this arrogant rabbi. When El Azar realized, since the guy literally put it up right up there in his face, that he had sinned, at least he had the grace to get off his donkey, bow before that man and say, I have insulted you. Please forgive me. And the fellow, and I'm not sure how to judge this, the fellow says, no, I will not forgive you until you go tell the artisan who created me how ugly is the vessel you created me. So poor El Azar has now asked for forgiveness and it hasn't been granted because of his vicious insult. So he follows the guy and as it happens they're walking on the road and they come to El Azar's hometown and when they get to El Azar's hometown everyone comes out to greet their rabbi and they say Shalom Alecha Rabbi Rabbi Mori Mori. Right? We greet you, our rabbi, our teacher and that other says who are you addressing this way? And they say, the man who's following you. And he says, if this is your rabbi, may there be few others like them among the Jews. One of the great rabbinic compliments is to say to a colleague, may there be many like you among the Jews. So he's absolutely inverting. He's saying, this is your teacher? We don't want this type. People are shocked. They ask what happens, and now he tells them exactly what happened. They, who know their rabbi and who love their rabbi, perhaps for all his arrogance, say you should forgive him, for he is a man great in Torah. This is perhaps debatable. Like I said, you can spend your life learning Torah and miss the point. Finally, he says, for your sakes I will forgive him, provided he no longer behaves this way. In other words, he's got to do tshuva. He really has to repent. He has to change his way. He has to see the other as someone created in the image and likeness of God, as someone who is a descendant of the first human being, as someone who has part of our community, and therefore, even if they are not us, we treat them with dignity. And then Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Shimon went and expounded. One should always be as pliable as a reed and not hard like the cedar. And then the Talmud gives a little moral to the story. Therefore, the reed merits to be made into a pen with which to write a Torah scroll, phylacteries, tefillin, and mezuzah. Right? So that very pliability, the ability to bend rather than the hardness that comes with arrogance in pushing away the other, that is the merit that we seek when we write a Torah. Thank you. Dr. Stone? So, um, we were all asked to think about the way in which we feel like the other. 
Look around me at the man to my right. At that man over there. I, need I say more? <laughs> so, um, we are going to look at, I, I too like Bert, uh, want to try to convey my points by looking at texts, and you have these texts in front of you. And you might, if you just looked at the first text, which is um, from page one, you've got it, from 2 Samuel, right? <coughs> uh, if you, hmm? I'm talking, how am I doing now? Good? You might be quite mystified how I'm going to pull this off if you looked at the first text. Because the first text is a very powerful and savage text from the Bible. Uh, it is about the hanging of King Saul's seven sons uh, by King David. And yet, we are going to walk our way through uh, a, a Gothic slash Halakhic text, right? The people who asked about this, you can't, they're, they're very hard to know sometimes whether they are Agada or Halakha. Uh, they're hybrids often. And uh, we're going to walk our way through a Midrashic commentary on this biblical text, and then a contemporary responsa. And the practical point of the contemporary responsa is actually going to be national insurance. So here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Here's our straw. <laughs> Let's see if we can do it. So let us begin, in fact. Um, Quickly, with the question that launches the inquiry into the biblical text, the question in the Mishnah. Right? So take a look at page two of my sources for a moment. Right? And the Mishnah records a law. The Mishnah in Yubabot. It records that bastards and nitinim are ineligible, meaning ineligible to join the congregation of Israel, Meaning Israelites may not marry with them, nor may they convert, as Mishnah later elaborates. And their eligibility is for all time, whether they be males or females. Now the nitinim literally means those who were given, and they are understood to be the descendants of the Gibeonites, who, were, who we are told in the Hebrew Bible were given into service as woodcutters and water drawers for the congregation and the altar. That is, in support of the temple service. Now the Talmud in our passage is searching for the scriptural source or a hint for the Mishnaic ruling that forever excludes the Gibeonites from entering the congregation of Israel. And it finds it in verse 2 of the biblical narrative we're going to look at. So go back to the first page, okay? and we see there was a famine right? in the days of David, three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, it is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. And the king called the Gibeonites and said to them, now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. So the rabbis read this verse, right? Now the Gibeonites were not Israelites. Right? And they read it as an indication that King David decreed their exclusion. And so, of course, the next question is, but why? Why did King David issue this decree? What did the Gibeonites do? And in the course of asking this question, the Agadah goes on to scrutinize, right, not only the legality and morality of the behavior of the Gibeonites, but also of King David and of King Saul. And I think in order to see what's really going on and the contribution that the Agata makes, it's worth it for a moment to just summarize the biblical story, right, so that we can kind of bracket, right, what Samuel tells us, right? As we said, right, the book of Samuel is telling us that there was a famine, 
three years of famine in the time of King David, and David seeks an audience from God, and God delivers an oracle because of Saul and his bloody house. Actually, literally, and the house of blood guilt. And the text then goes on to say, because he put to death the Gibeonites. Hard to tell how much this is meant to be. You've seen this oracle and how much it is an extension of the text. And then the text says, the Gibeonites were not of Israelite stock, right? But a remnant of the Amorites, to whom the Israelites had given an oath. Now the book of Joshua, right, in chapter 9, tells us that the Gibeonites were a group of people who dwelled in the land of Canaan. And they were very afraid. They were afraid that Joshua was going to eradicate them, as he did the other nations living in Canaan. So what did they do? They disguised themselves as a foreign people, recently arrived from a distant, non canaanite land, and entered into a treaty with Joshua. And Joshua swore them an oath of alliance. Now, when the deceit was discovered, right, that the Gibeonites had fooled Joshua, the oath could not be undone. The Israelites considered themselves bound by the treaty and did not drive them out or destroy their cities. Instead, they were given into service, right, to the priests as the woodcutters and water doors. Now, nowhere in the Hebrew Bible does it actually record any violence on the part of Saul directly against them, right? Only here it states Saul had tried to wipe them out in his zeal for the people of Israel and Judah, right? When David summons them, asking them, right, what shall I ransom so that you will bless God's estate, they say, in the biblical narrative, right? That they don't want gold, they don't want silver, right? But they do want the talio, right? Measure for measure, right? They have a claim against Saul, right? Who did them an injury that was the equivalent of wiping them out, right? unspecified where and how. And they want Saul's since Saul is dead and they cannot retaliate against Saul, let seven men from among his issue be handed over to us, and we will impale them to God in Givat Shaul. And David says, I will deliver. And then the book of Samuel goes on to tell that David spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, again because of an oath. Right? because of the oath between Jonathan and David, right? but took the children from uh, Ritzpah and five sons from Michal, Saul's daughter, and all seven were hung. And the text concludes by saying, after that, God yielded to the earth. So this is a very dramatic and rather savage story. Right? Let's see what is done with it. So here we have to go back to page two. <coughs> and what we're going to find, I think, right, is that the Midrash takes what is a political narrative, right, the story of a treaty and a story of what it takes to build a nation, right? The kind of sacrifice, right? The sacrifice of the few for the many that is needed to build a nation, right? To ensure this, right, continued living, right, in accordance with the oath of different groups, multi-ethnic, right, and different groups with one, one polity, right? And it turns it from politics to ethics. So let's see how it does that. First, David, in a way, is transformed from king to judge. So let's go to the Gemara. And Rav Chana Biada states, why did he issue the decree against him? And then cites the verse. There was a famine. And now the Midrash, right, interpolates, right, between the verses. Says there was a famine three years, year after year. 
here. And so Midrash says, yes, David made inquiries as to why this disaster had befallen the people of Israel. Perhaps they were idolaters or transgressors, or maybe they withheld charity in the congregation. Right? Maybe they weren't responsible. Right? That theme is already coming out in the Agadah, the theme of responsibility for the acts of others and for the fate of others. After all, David assumes the individuals in the community are responsible for the famine, and all Israel suffers for the acts of some. But none were found to have sinned, and all were found to have given charity. And then the Midrash states quite strikingly, so then David says, Hakol talui bi, which is both a, ton, a pun, right, for it all hangs on me, right, and a deeply ambiguous statement, right? Is David concluding that this must be on account of his own personal failures? Or is he alluding to the assumption of responsibility? And then, right, the Agadah goes back immediately to the biblical text and says, immediately David, right, as the initial verse had concluded, sought the face of the Lord, looking for an explanation from God. Right? And then the verse reads, as I quoted before, it is for Saul, right, and his bloody house, because he put to death the Gibeonites. Now we could read it, and in fact Josephus read it this way, as a straightforward indictment of Saul and his family. But we could also divide it up a little, right? It could be terser. It's for Saul and his bloody house, right? And then the rest is an explanation. Now, the rabbinic narrative actually pursues this strategy because it actually reads the statement, the oracle from God, as referring to two sins, two oath violations, one by Saul and the other by David, who failed to bury and honor Saul properly. So now, the Talmud comes back to our open question, right? It's kind of because there's been this open question, this gap all along. Where are we getting that Saul put to death the Gibeonites? And the Agadah goes on and explains. The truth is that he killed the inhabitants of the city of Noph, the city of priests, whom the Gibeonites were supplying with food and water. And scripture regards it as if he himself has killed them. Right? So we might recall the events in 1 Samuel, right, when Saul orders Doeg the Edomite to kill the priests and the entire town because the priest Abimelech at Nob had given refuge to David when David fled from Saul's anger. And Saul thought of this as an act of treason. The Gibeonites, as the servants of the slaughtered priests, lost their livelihood. Now, some died in a famine, right? Not all. And the Talmud often associates loss of livelihood, right, with a form of death. It equates preventing people from sustaining themselves, in some way, with killing them, right? And recall also that in Joshua, that Joshua, right, in Judges, right, had, in fact, sworn an oath that he would sustain the Gibeonites. And this is actually seen as something that heads of state right, have to continue that obligation. So the failure to sustain the Gibeonites is now seen as the crime right, and equated with the direct act of killing. And Saul is responsible for the fallout of his command to Doeg, and this responsibility now is actually extended to David. So the Talmud, right, having unearthed the crime, right, invokes the need for justice. Justice is demanded for Saul because he was not properly mourned, and justice is demanded because he put to death the Gibeonites. And now, right, the Talmud reverts back again to the biblical text, Right? And it starts interweaving the verses of the biblical text 
with its own commentary. So it says we can't do anything about Saul because the 12 months have elapsed, right? It would be very unusual to arrange mourning, but we can do something about the Gibeonites. He summons them and says we will try to pacify them. This is the Agatic version, right? He tries to pacify them, but they wouldn't be pacified. Right? They said, no gold, no silver, only one thing, Saul's seven sons. And at that point, David says to them, this nation is distinguished by three characteristics. This nation, meaning Israel. Three characteristics, mercy, bashfulness, and benevolence. And only one who cultivates these three characteristics is fit to join the nation. Right? We now have an explanation for why David ordered the decree. They cannot join the covenantal community because they've been cruel. Right? They don't exhibit, they did not cultivate the trait of mercy. But there's more to it than that, and we have to continue. Right? There's a bit of a digression here that I don't want to spend any time on in the Agatha text. But there's a concern, right? The Agatha is legally sensitive. And they're a little worried here about David's decision, actually. Right? Perhaps the Canaanites weren't merciful, but what about David? He hung them. Right? First, the first concern is, wait a minute, wait a minute. He spared Jonathan's son, right? Did he engage in favoritism? And the text goes on, the Agata goes on to try to dispel any notion of favoritism. Right? Interesting theme that's invoked already. Was there favoritism then? Right? No, no, no. Right? This was, right? And it explains it away. But then it goes to the crux of the matter. And it says, but surely it is written in the Bible itself. The father shall not be put to death for the children and children not for the fathers. And what's the answer? The Agadah gives the following answer. Rabbi Chia Bar Abba replied in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, it is better that a letter be rooted out of the Torah than that the divine name will be publicly profaned. And then the text goes on to explain similarly, right? It's a Philo Hashem here, right? That is overriding the letter of the law. And it goes on to explain similarly about leaving the bodies hanging, right, all night on the tree, which is also a violation. And again, the text says, it's proper that a letter be rooted out of the Torah so that the heavenly name will be publicly hallowed. For passers-by were inquiring, what kind of men are these hanging on the trees? And they're told they are royal princes. And then the passers-by ask, and what have they done? They had their hands upon unattached strangers. Right? And then the passers-by would exclaim, there is no nation in existence which one ought to join as much as this one. If the punishment of royal princes is so great, how much more that of common people? And if such is done for unattached proselytes, how much more so for Israelites? And then 150,000 men convert. Uh, so now, we're clearly not in the biblical domain anymore. We're certainly in a, right, in a realm of exile, where the idea of being observed and the impressions made, right, is pressing and it's palpable. Passers-by need to be convinced <coughs> of the moral worth of the religion. And God's honor is at stake, right? The honor of ensuring justice for the stranger. It's done in a very difficult context. Right? Because this is an instance in which collective punishment, in a sense, is upheld, right? As an instance of, right, collective punishment as something that is understood to be against the letter of the law, and yet is upheld here as serving a higher value in this instance, right? It's your classic 
hard case in which right two norms are conflicting. One, to give justice, and the other, not to do it in this manner, right? Not in this unlawful manner. Now, and yet, right, the text is telling us that while the Gibeonites weren't merci merciful, they actually were somehow within their legal rights, right? Something, they had a claim. They had a claim, and justice demands some kind of accounting. And more to the point, you can't live well as a respected member of a political community <coughs> without being in some way having your wrongs righted, being given your due in some way. There needs to be a kind of equalizing. This is a theme that we have all around us, right, in the process of political reconciliation between groups. But the editor made a very interesting choice here because every other version actually pins the righteousness of collective just punishment in this instance on the fact that it was ordered by God or on the fact that the house of Saul as a whole was collectively responsible and engaged with Saul somehow in the end. Right? or some kind of vicarious responsibility as a whole. This text doesn't do that. And it's actually an interesting editorial choice. It's not accidental. It actually sets it up, right? It sets up instead the opposite norm. It doesn't faint. It makes it a matter of, right? It doesn't let David off the hook, so to speak. It makes David making a choice. It actually also does, though, in the context of being very uh, slyly and cleverly crafting a rule. Because the letter of the law now is no collective punishment. That's the letter of the law, right? It's, right, so that it's very carefully crafting it. At the same time, it is making it, right, a damn not to obey the letter of the law in this particular case, right? That's the value. So where is the value and what do we learn from it? What is this value? So here, I think, right, we already have hints, right, from the text itself. The text of the Agadah is actually seemingly saying that there is favoritism in some way, right? That is, one has to favor the vulnerable group in society. One has to extend oneself here. One has to commit an act of sacrifice of the few, right, here, right, because this is a vulnerable group with a claim, a group that's on the fringe of society. Now this is a, you know, it's, it's a reading. You have to really go, right, you have to press to do this reading. So that takes me to a contemporary halachic responsa. Because right, we have a text that engages really in exactly this reading. It's a very interesting one because it is generated right, after the state of Israel has been established. And it is therefore uniting two aspects of the original biblical text, which is a political narrative, right, with the ethical aspects of the Agadic text. And it features very prominently, right, what is, what, what is the ethical lesson that's learned? It's a halachic responsum by Rabbi Chaim David Halevi, who was famous for authorizing a series of innovative responsa in which principles, right, so, right, the little Hashem, not, right, not profaning the divine name, or Kiddush Hashem, sanctifying the name, those are principles, right? We don't know precisely what, to use a legal term, right? How they're going to come out. They're not like rules. They're not predictable, but they have weight, right? They have a lot of weight. And he was very famous for authoring opinions that gave these principles, right? A unique, even a, maybe a unique norm-generating role. And he viewed this rabbinic narrative, right, as highly paradigmatic. Right? He combines several themes from this narrative. The definition of Saul's crime as deprivation of livelihood, which is equated with murder. 
The notion of glorifying God, of sanctifying his name and avoiding profaning his name by favoring the rights of strangers over the house of Saul, right, over the aristocratic members of Israel, and also the ideal of mercy as a personal characteristic, right, that is incumbent on Jews, and he combines them all to anchor the duty of the state to provide hostile civilian populations with material sustenance. That's the duty. And how practically, right, he says all Israel has this responsibility. It is a national, collective responsibility. And he draws, too, on the theme of, right, what caused the famine? Was someone not charitable? Stuck up, right? The thematic of stucca, it is important to sustain the poor of the city, whether Jewish or non-Jewish, right? He takes all of these themes of the Agadah and he weaves them together to find this, in fact, as a rule, a legal obligation, right? And what's the practical import? Actually, how happened this be done in practice? National insurance. So we've gotten it. We've gotten from the biblical text to national insurance. Okay, how much time do I have left? Three minutes? Okay, so let me say two points. Right, let me say two points about this. This is a very difficult text. Levinas is famous for having singled out this text as being, you know, difficile. Okay. How far? Right? Because the, there are these ethical values here that are extolled, charity, mercy, benevolence, right? These are aspirations. And the text is actually walking, it's doing a very delicate tightrope here between those virtues that apply in the covenantal community and that actually create the Gibeonites' exclusion from the covenantal community because they don't have those dispositions, those ethical dispositions, and those aspirations, those virtues that we might want to extend, right? Extend into political and civil society. And I think it leaves us with a very interesting question. How far can we extend these covenantal ethical dispositions and responsibilities? Something that we might call an ethics of the family. Mercy here is actually not standing on your rights. Right? Could you imagine in a family if everybody stood on their rights? It's a kind of familial ethic, right, of living together in this very, very tight, familial sort of way. What can we do with it? And yet what we also see is that the rabbis over time take these dispositions, these ethics, right, that, both, that are covenantal, and they do, in fact, extend them beyond the covenantal, certainly to brotherhood within the nation. Indeed, this very rabbi, right, chief, he was the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv, Rabbi Halevi, he's also the author of another responsa in which he addresses the question of how to create bonds of civil solidarity in the state of Israel among a multi-ethnic population. And he tries, in fact, to extend what are viewed as bonds that Right? Bonds of social solidarity, acts of loving kindness, that strictly speaking, are acts within the covenant of one member to another, and to extend them to all members of the state, <coughs> Jews and non-Jews. Right? So this is a very interesting process that we can look at. Thank you. that uh, both of my parents immigrated to the United States from, from Europe. Um, my mother, when she was approximately 18 years old, my father, when he was in his um, you know, late 20s already. Um, and they remained greenness all of their lives. Um, and, you know, as I began thinking about immigration, I realized that I was not thinking about uh, 
anyone more distant than my parents' bedroom. Um, and that sort of drove me to begin to think a little bit differently about immigration, and also drove me sort of to an unusual direction in the sense that I started where I would normally start um, looking at any issue and the relationship of Jewish law to any um, social issue, and that is to, um, to ask the question of where the Rambam and the Mishnah Torah had codified these particular laws, and so I started searching the Rambam for laws regulating uh, the relationship to immigrants, and there wasn't the um, Hilchot immigrants, um, nor does it exist in the Shulchan Aruch. And, and so I then began to turn further back and found myself getting stuck um, on Sefer Bereshit. And what I would like to do with you, and the reason I didn't give out any, um, any sheets, is that we're, we're going to be moving relatively rapidly uh, through the whole of Sefer Bereshit. And what I would like to argue to you, essentially, is that the entire Sefer Bereshit is the book of immigration and immigrants. And that, in fact, the vast majority of the narrative in Sefer Bereshit has to do with one or another aspect of the experience of immigrants. And we will look at four aspects of the experience of immigrants. First of all, what motivates immigration or immigration? Secondly, what vulnerabilities does an immigrant experience in the experience of being an immigrant? Thirdly, what strategies does the immigrant use to deal with the vulnerabilities of the situations in which he or she finds him or herself? And then fourthly, what does the Torah do with all of that? So once we have done our, our, our sort of survey of the whole of Sefer Bereshit, we will then need to look at the rest of the Torah to see what the Torah does with all of this body of narrative. So I will spare you a number of chapters in the book of Rishi, not because there are any chapters that do not reflect in one form or another on the book of Rishi, but only because I'm limited in time and, and you know, it's, it's getting dark and pretty soon people are going to want to go home uh, before tomorrow morning. So uh, what I would like to do is do some selected elements of the major narratives of Sefer Breshid to look precisely at the question of what they tell us about um, immigrants. So in the Torah itself, I mean, the first direct sort of chosen moment of, of immigration is Abraham, right, who responding to the divine command sees before him a blessed life. He's going to go to a country where the streets are paved with gold. Um, and everything will be perfect, and the whole world will be blessed, and his family will be blessed. And so he picks himself up from Haram, albeit the rabbis have some different ideas about his having actually left because of religious prejudice and intolerance and his needing to get out of the country rapidly. But the Torah doesn't tell us that. The Torah portrays that initial travel of Avraham as a travel because of a vision of a blessed life ahead. But almost immediately thereafter, only 10 verses later in chapter 12, after Abraham had already arrived in Canaan, he's on his way again. Why? Because 10 verses later, there's a famine in Canaan. And so Abraham has to leave. He has to go find food. Well, the closest place to find food will be Egypt. So, right, here's Abraham, think for a moment, Abraham from ur Kasdim and come to Haran, and then sort of south and, and you know, west, and, and ends up in Canaan. Has he ever been to Egypt before? No, never been to Egypt before. Has he read the Father's Guide to Egypt before he travels to Egypt? No, not to the best of our knowledge, although it was not yet publishing at that point in time, right? So, nevertheless, Abraham knows something about what it is he is going to experience as an immigrant into Egypt. He knows that they will take his wife, and that if he resists, they will kill him. Right? He somehow knows that. He probably did not get that information off the web. <laughs> Nor was the information hidden in a cloud of any sort. He knew it because 
she knew the realities of the world. And the realities of the world were that immigrants, strangers, were essentially undefended. And so, he's making this trip down to Egypt, and in the face of the vulnerability that he is now experiencing, of the possibility that they may take and rape his wife and murder him, he does what immigrants learn to do. He lies. So yes, I know that A.E. Spicer has this long, complicated exposition about he wasn't really a lie, it was right, the wife sister motif, and he thought that the people in Egypt would understand that, you know, there was such a thing as a wife sister who was more protected by the clan and would be safer, and they would, at least he might be able to stall them off for a while on that basis. Be that as it may, the reality is, when push comes to shove, he lied. And he lied because... No, he thought that was the only way he was going to protect himself and his wife from the condition, the natural condition of immigrants in which he was going to find himself. And of course, sure enough, when he gets there, uh, everything that he expects happens, and it happens much more rapidly even than he expects it to happen. Um, and and um, when the uh, king of Egypt confronts him and, and asks him, how come he lied to them? Um, you know, he tells the truth and the king doesn't deny it. And in fact, fascinating that the very first narrative about Avraham after he returns to Canaan is what? He welcomes guests. He offers them water, he offers them food. He hosts them until they leave. And the Torah then goes on, that's in chapter 18. And then in chapter 19, the Torah says, well, maybe you'll think that that's okay because it's, it's in Canaan that that happens. It's not Egypt. It's only in Egypt that there's really trouble for immigrants. So the Torah immediately tells us a story about a group of messengers who go down to meet with Lot in stone. And what happens to those strangers as they enter into stone? We all know, right? The residents of the city demand that they be handed over for homosexual rape. And, and Lot, in his defense of them, is even willing to hand over his own daughters, right? And, and they reject that. And so what do the strangers do to protect themselves and Lot in that situation? They use violence and they flee. Right? Which immigrants often do. Um, then Abraham confronts another famine, right? He confronts another famine, and, and this time he goes only to Grar, to Philistia, to the, Philistia, to the border territory. And, and there, again, the same thing happens. He lies again, again, it is ineffective. Um, and, and Avimelech is, is confronted by God, and, and, um, uh, and, and Avimelech then confronts Abraham. And Abraham explains his fear to him that he was afraid that they would take his wife and, and kill him. And, and Avimelech does not disagree. Avimelech does not say, How could you possibly suspect us of that? Us? We are a civilized nation, right? We are practices, pra practitioners of Zelia. We, right? we, we recognize our responsibility to strangers, right? Avimelech doesn't say anything of the sort. Avimelech says, You know what? Let's enter into a treaty. Let's enter into a treaty. Um, um, and in this treaty, he tells Avram that now he's safe. He can go anywhere he wants in the land. But of course, despite the treaty, Avram's property remains vulnerable. Every well he digs gets stolen. And when Avimelech comes back to Avram, Avram does what is reasonable to do in that situation, at least to try chastise the powers that be and say, hey, listen, you know, your people are, are your servants, your own servants are, huh, they're stealing my wells. And what's Avimelech's response? Everybody remembers that. We read about it on the first day of Rosh Hashanah. That's why we read about it on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, because we should remember how not to respond when somebody chastises us, right? So what's Avimelech's response to this chastisement? says, oh, no, yeah, not he. I, I didn't know anything about that. Miyazata Tavarase? Who could possibly have done such a thing? Right? Right? Blaming the victim. You didn't think you didn't. Why didn't you come to me and tell me?
shown me about this before, right? That is, Avinach is filled with denial. Filled with denial. Because in fact, there is no readiness to assume responsibility for the well-being of the stranger, neither for the safety of his wife, nor the safety of his life, nor the well-being of his economic condition. Um, he is vulnerable, he is vulnerable in every conceivable way, and even when he tries to protect himself by lying, and sometimes even by threat of violence, <coughs> nothing seems to work. The, the theme of the economic vulnerability of the, of, of, the um, um, of, of the immigrant is then further carried through, of course, in the story of Abraham and Benichet, right? Where he recognizes he needs to buy a burial place for Sarah, and he realizes that, you know, if he strikes a quiet deal with Benichet, what's going to happen? A week later, they're going to reclaim the property and say the whole thing was not a deal. And so the only way Avram thinks he's going to be safe is by doing the entire deal publicly. Everybody's got to know about this one, right? There's got to be no room for deniability as to the validity of the contract, because he knows if not, he has no security whatsoever. So he's going to be able to go to court and sue him, right? Ah, can tell. Are you kidding? He's going to be able to sue Avram. He knows his condition. He knows what his circumstances are. He knows he is simply vulnerable in a way that does not allow for any remedy. It's interesting, of course, that when the Eved Avraham, when the servant of Avraham is sent to find a wife for his son Yitzchak, and Avraham tells him, just from my family, right? Select someone from my family. There's only a single test that the Evan Avraham establishes for who that person would be. And what was that test? The welcoming of the stranger and offering water to him and his camels. Obviously, this was not a commonly expected response, or else Elazar, or whoever it was, would have been inundated with possible candidates for marriage. Right? I mean, obviously, he expected that this is such an unusual trait that he'll really be able to find the one person who embodies that trait. So the Torah is laying out for us uh, a, a set of realizations about um, why people become immigrants, whether it's because of some great vision that they have of a great life ahead, or it's because of famine, the vulnerabilities that they experience, the vulnerabilities of their lives, to their property, um, to their, their wives, um, their sexual vulnerability. And the Torah then continues, of course. Um, it does the same thing in the life of Yitzchak. Yitzchak also emigrates because of a famine. He goes to Gerar, he engages in the same lies. He discovers an interesting new element the locals are really jealous of him, as in, in, right, in chapter 26, verses 14 and 15. They're really jealous of him. They're jealous of his economic success. And so what, what have they done in the interim? All of Abraham's wells, they had stuffed them up. What are they, insane? People living in, 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 in Israel? in Canaan, stuffing up wells. I mean, you survive only on wells. You can't stuff up wells, right? But if you're jealous of someone, if you're furious at someone else's success, particularly his success when he's not even a belonger, he doesn't belong there, he's a friend there, right? That jealousy can drive people to do things that are even against their own best interests. Right? And so Yitzchak has to escape. He wants to escape the hatred. He wants to escape the economic restrictions. When he is met by Avimelech, and Avimelech says, let's, let's enter into a treaty together, Yitzchak says to him straight out, well, I, don't I know that you hate me. Why, why do you want to enter into a treaty with me for? Then there is a series of narratives related to immigration, related to Yaakov. Right? Jacob first flees Canaan to go back to Haran. Why? Because he's afraid for his life. His brother is trying to kill him. Right? And so Jacob flees. 
chapter 28, he migrates back to Haran. What does he meet in Haran at every step of the way? He meets up with deception. He is first deceived about his wife. He is then deceived about his salary. He is deceived about everything. About everything. And in fact, Lavan is not even embarrassed to say to him when Yaakov challenges Lavan and says, how come you deceived me about my wife? I was supposed to marry Rachel, not Leah. So, so Lavan says to him, well, well, you're just a dreamer here, right? I mean, don't you know the customs of this society? In this society, we don't allow younger daughters to marry before the older daughters. Right? If you belonged here, you would understand that. Right? So I mean, Lavan basically d does everything that he can. And Yaakov understands that he is being deceived at every step of the way. Albeit, what's interesting is that in the case of Yaakov, every succeeding deception leads him to work even harder. An interesting response. Every succeeding deception. Okay, so you deprive me of Rachel, I'll work for another seven years for Rachel. Okay, you change my salary. All right, I'll work. I'll stay up all night. I won't even bring the dead sheep to you and the goats to you. I'll, I'll swallow those losses myself. And with all of that, what happens in the end? He understands that his brothers-in-law, love and sons, are jealous and angry about his success. And they're saying, look, Yaakov has stolen everything that belongs to our father, which means he's taking away our inheritance. And Lavan himself becomes resentful of Jacob. And so Yaakov acknowledges Lavan's injustice, confesses to his wives that there's no hope for him here, and does what immigrants do. Immigrants do, they deceive. So he deceived Lavan by not telling him of his flight. And he left. There are other elements here that are, are you know, also interesting and I won't, won't go into. But Yaakov makes it back to Canaan, right? Welcome back to Canaan, Yaakov, after 21 years. First thing that happens is what? Dina gets raped. And Hamor, right? Kishmo came home, right? Really was this Hamor, this ass of a man. Hamor comes to Jacob and he says, Listen, we'll enter into a treaty. You know, let my son Shechem keep your daughter and we'll, you know, it'll be okay. You know, we'll marry your daughters, you'll marry our daughters, we'll do business together. No problems here, right? No problems here. Yaakov is intimidated, but his sons are not. And so Shimon and Levi go off and do what? After Hamor and Shechem have agreed to be circumcised, or at least that every male who leaves the town be circumcised. Reuben and Levi, Shimon and Levi go ahead and they do what? They kill out the residents of Shechem. Right? Because they're not going to take it. And Yaakov is infuriated and frightened. What does Yaakov say to his sons? Right? Yaakov says to him, what are you doing? What are you doing? All of the neighboring tribes are now going to gang up and kill us. Right? From your kind of fear? Can't, can't stand up for yourself. If you stand up for yourself, they'll, they'll gang up on you and wipe you out. And sure enough, Levi, in that initial presentation, have the last word. They say, well, you expect us to, to tolerate making our sister like a prostitute? But Yaakov later has the last word, right? Yaakov curses their anger. It's unresolved. Yaakov never gets past the state of fear that he lives in all of his life because he doesn't feel any sense of security at all. And finally, Joseph. So Joseph is interesting, right? Joseph comes to Egypt as what? Slave. He's sold into slavery into Egypt. He didn't come to Egypt because he had this great vision that Egypt the streets were paved with gold. He didn't go to Egypt because there was a famine. He didn't go 
come because a brother was chasing him to kill him. He didn't come because, right, any other reason. He came because he was sold as a slave. And he gets there, and what does he discover as this foreign slave? He discovers that he is sexually vulnerable, that Potiphar's wife can accuse him of having attempted to rape her with impunity because he has no legal rights and she can do whatever she wants. And so he ends up in jail. And he interprets correctly a dream of the Sarah Mashkim. And before the Sarah Mashkim leaves jail, Joseph pleads with him, just remember me, get me out of here. And the Torah then immediately testifies about the Sarah Mashkim, this trustworthy, honorable person who in his relationship to this slave in prison feels no responsibility whatsoever, says the Torah. He didn't remember him. And he forgot him right away. He only remembered him when he thought he could benefit by referring him to the king. And so the king, after his dreams, pulls Yosef out of the prison and brings him up to interpret the dreams. So without getting into the question of why the king liked Joseph's interpretation, which we might be able to well understand, but really liked Joseph's interpretation of what it would mean for the power of the king, he pulls him out. But it's interesting. Yosef is now the first one to make it in a foreign society. Right? So what price does Joseph pay? Take a look at the verses in chapter 41, beginning with verse 39 till 45. And you see exactly what price Joseph had to pay to make it. First of all, he had to be shaven. Right? And show up in the king's palace with a beard, farvaxen. Sphira Sarimer on top of everything else. No. Be shaved. They had to change his clothes. You can't wear a foreigner's clothes. Right? You have to wear the right clothes if you're going to make it. You have to, the, the king provides him with a town car. Because, I mean, you, you know, you can't drive around. If you're part of the king's retinue, you, you can't drive around in a Mini Cooper or anything like that. Right? I mean, that you know. So the king's, the king's chariot has to be provided for him. They change his name, and they marry him off to a local. So Joseph makes it. But those are the prices that he had to pay to make it. Is that why Joseph stuck his family out in Goshen? In any case, so what we have here is an extraordinary picture. A picture of motives of emigration, of the extraordinary vulnerabilities that a person experiences, of even the best of people, the kinds of strategies that they need to come up with to respond defensively to their situations. And then what does the Torah do with all of this? So I would suggest to you that if you take a look at the legislation of Torah related to Gerim, you see a fascinating progression. First of all, in regard to the lives of Gerim, the Torah not only includes every human being in Lo Tirzach, in the prohibition against homicide, but the Torah explicitly extends the duty of rescue to the Ger Toshav. Leviticus 25.35 says, says, says Nachmanides, this means that the legal duty of rescue, which based on Lutamara Damrecha applies only to fellow Jews, doesn't apply only to fellow Jews, applies also to Ger Toshav. Now remember that the term Ger in the Torah, as was indicated earlier, is a multivocal term. And the Torah does not really provide us with a good distinction between the Ger who is the convert and the Ger who is the alien. And there's good reason for that. Because they're both immigrants. One is a geographic immigrant, the other one is a spiritual immigrant. But anybody can tell you that the fundamental challenges they confront in integrating within a community are not 
that dissimilar. And those of us who live today in the real world, who see what's going on in Israel and elsewhere in relation to the status of converts to Judaism, can see it without any difficulty, right? We see the playing out of the animosities, of the disadvantages, of the lack of defenses. In any case, so the Torah clearly, clearly wants to create legislation that says the life of the Ger Toshav has to be protected. His life is not Hefka. Then, in regard to sexual assault, the Torah in Vayikra chapter 18 explicitly extends all of the elements of criminal law related to sexual assault, extends those beyond the citizen to encompass the Ger Hagar Betovachem. And then, in regard to questions of economic disadvantage, as had been mentioned before, the Torah in a dozen different places makes explicit reference to the impermissibility of economically disadvantaging the gay. Impermissible to oppress him, impermissible to deceive him. Any economic accounting with him has to be done with exactitude. The gay is routinely combined with the atom and the almana, with the orphan and the widow, as persons who are particularly vulnerable, who therefore require the special protection of the law, and the general declaration, the repeated general declaration of the Torah, that the same law shall apply to you, the citizen, and to the Ger Hagar <coughs> And so, in Deuteronomy 1, in Exodus 12, in Deuteronomy 24, over and over again, Shvat ben Tzedek ben Yishu ben Achiv uven Gero, Torah achat yela ezrach va ger agar betochachem, lo tate mishpat ger yatom v'almana, v'zachar tat yevel ayitam v'mitzrayim. Remember what it was like when you were slaves in Egypt. Over and over again. And then, in an extraordinary step, the Torah addresses the issue of emotional antagonism to the ger. And the Torah says, you know what? You have a duty to be an Ohev Geir. You have a duty to love the Geir. V'yahavta lo kamocha. Just like v'yahavta lo reacha kamocha, v'yahavta lo kamocha. And then, as the topper for that, ki ashoi t'yichem u'se mishpat yasu v'almona v'ohev Geir. Because God himself loves the vulnerable. God himself loves the immigrant, says the Torah. Now, one final element here. What, what has the Torah done? The Torah has taken this narrative, this extraordinary narrative exposition of the vulnerabilities of Gerim and how they respond and the Torah has turned around and said, we cannot, in the, in the nation that Israel will be, we cannot tolerate those kinds of vulnerabilities being experienced by anyone who lives within our borders. Nor can we leave the resolution of these matters to the moral discretion of individuals. It's not just you know, sort of Odysseus discovering five places where, where Xenia is extended to him and five places where, 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 where they hate strangers, they fear strangers. It's not, it's not just an Iliad in which individual action will have to resolve the, the offense against Xenia. The society needs to be regulated fundamentally, clearly, and unequivocally in regard to its conduct in relation to immigrants. And that's what the Torah does. It sets out a massive body of legislation related to the conduct of the citizenry toward the immigrant. It demands that his life be respected, that his sexual identity or her sexual identity be respected, that they be granted the same legal protections as any other citizen, that they not be placed at economic disadvantage, 
that they not be subjected to emotional antagonism, and that you extend toward them the same kind of love and caring that you extend toward any citizen. And that those have to be matters of law, not matters of individual discretion. But then, of course, the Torah turns around. And in its extraordinary sensitivity to the balance between rights and duties, having granted all of these rights to immigrants via the creation of duties by Jews toward those persons, the Torah then raises the obvious question, well, what exactly are the duties of immigrants? To which I would suggest to you the answer as the sages understood it, and virtually in every instance, through literal adaptation of Sukkim in the Torah, were the Noahide commandments. That is, you can't take life, guys. You can't steal. You can't swear falsely. You can't act in a cruel and inhuman manner even toward animals. You can't commit adultery or other sexual crimes. The very same rights that the society will grant you, you have to enact as your duties toward every other member of the society. And it's within that balance of the correlatives that the Torah is then able to attempt to shape a society in which the understanding of mutual responsibilities and mutual rights has at least a fighting chance of creating a situation in which the imitation of God's qualities of love of the stranger could possibly be achieved. Eventually, of course, the rabbis have to struggle with all sorts of details in relation to these issues. And even in medieval times, Questions related to the Cheskat issue of whether immigrants really have a right to enter. Right? So if you're going to have to grant them all of these rights if they come in, do you have a right to exclude them? Maybe you have a right to exclude them. And that way you won't have to grant them those rights. They struggled enormously with those issues. And there were rabbis who said, well, maybe that should be an entitlement. And Marama Rutberg said, no, no, no community is entitled to exclude people. Not entirely. And if you tell me, said Marama Rutenberg in an extraordinary tshuva, and if you tell me, well, it's really the nobleman, right, the ruler of the manse, who said we can't allow any more Jews to come in and live here, he says, you can't even do it then, because I know what's going to happen. If I say that under those circumstances you can exclude fellow Jews, then suddenly every ruler will be saying that he can't, it's okay, no, you can keep out your fellow Jews. So there's no, no, these are not simple issues ultimately to resolve. But the foundation that the Torah lays through the narrative and safe abrasion, and then its subsequent legislation to see to it that there is an embodiment of these values in the concrete reality of the legal governance of the society that I believe we need to take to see how, what the implications of this are for us both in Israel and here in the United States, as citizens of this country. What, what is it that Torah is demanding of us to which we need to respond? Thank you.